This is a great Sunday. We've kind of messed everything up along the way. <laughs> about the only thing we can do is laugh about it going. And isn't that the human condition? No, I, I, I've talked to older folks who tell me, you know, I, I've got to the place that when I go looking for something and discover I put it somewhere else, or I'm looking for my glasses and then I find that they're on my head, that I just laugh about it and go on. That's, that's about the way we have to do, isn't it? Uh, with so many things in life. But the kids do such a great job. And there's all you can do is just sit there and not get up and get down and lift up with them. Did you want to do that? Sure. <laughs> sure? Well, let's get the kids back and we'll try. <laughs> <laughs> now I didn't really want to do that. I, I chose the text this morning because it was one of the stories in the Bible school that the kids love. They learned a bit about the story of Moses going to Pharaoh and the ten plagues that were sent and the staff turning into a snake. But I wanted to take us a little bit behind the scenes so that we can really begin to grasp what's going on in this story. There's more than meets the eye. God and the knowledge of God had once been on the earth, but it's been forgotten. Nobody knows who he is. Nobody remembers God anymore. They've all known about it because everyone's descended from Noah and the flood. And it's interesting that if you look in the mythologies, the stories, the myths, uh, 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 the fables of every culture on the earth, even Indian tribes, in the darkest, deepest Brazilian jungle, they all have a flood story in which the whole world is destroyed. But one family or one couple or one man survives. In some legends, it's an ark. In some, it's just a big boat or a canoe. But it's always the same. So it's in the memory of every people. They've all known. But they had forgotten about God. And God wants to bring knowledge of God back to the earth. And so he chooses one family. He takes Abraham and his wife, Sarah. And he tells him, I'm going to build a great nation out of you. And that nation is going to be a light to the whole world. The whole world is going to be blessed with them. He's going to take them and make a people. And then he's going to put them at the center of the world. And you and I might think of Israel, or the problem where Israel is today is kind of an out of the way, small place. But at that time, that was the center of the world. If you would have looked at your geography a little bit, you would realize that the Mediterranean Sea runs something like this. And there's mountains up here, and there's deserts down here. You've got a great, the biggest, greatest civilization of all is Egypt located right here. And then up in here is the Assyrian Empire, Babylon, Persia, all of those places, another great empire. And then at that time in history in Mesopotamia, there, there were, was an empire beginning there. All the trade routes had to come through here. And that's exactly where God put Israel. Right at the crossroads of all the trade routes of the world. That way the message of God would go out to the whole world. But first God's got to demonstrate who he is and his power and that he is the God of the universe. And then he gives them his law so that they will then demonstrate his character to the world. So the world can know what he's like. But we're at the point where he's got to demonstrate his power. And so what he does is he takes that one family who by now is centered in Jacob and his wife and twelve sons. And that's all there is of the people of God. And their wives and children. It's one clap. And he takes them out of that desert area where there's fighting going on all the time because everybody wants to control it. Everybody wants to control that. If you control that area, you control the trade of the world. And so everybody's always attacking it. So he gets them out of there where it's not safe and where it's difficult to survive and brings them into Egypt during the time of Joseph. And when he gets them into Egypt, they're given the very best land of Egypt. 
And they can live in Egypt under the protection of this most powerful army on earth at the time, the Egyptian army. And for 400 years, they don't have any worries. They're in the best land. They don't have to worry about enemies because they live under the protection of Egypt. And they just increase and increase and increase until we get to the time of Moses. There's about a million of them. Nearly a million people came out of Egypt on that exodus. And in that 400 years, God has protected them and they've increased and grown and grown and grown in a way they never could have done in Palestine. But now it's time for God to demonstrate who he is. When we think, well, yeah, but the Pharaoh oppressed them. That was only the last Pharaoh. But 360 or 70 years, they were blessed. And the Pharaohs looked favorably on them. It was only when Ramesses came to the throne that the oppression began. And so God now sends Moses and his brother Aaron into Egypt, and he's going to, to tell them, I'm going to bring you out of Egypt, out of the power of the most powerful nation in the world, and I'm going to demonstrate my power so that even all of the Egyptians will know that I am God. And it's interesting how he goes about it. As he begins to work to bring his people out, the first thing he does is challenge all of their human power. He has Aaron bring his staff and throw his staff down and his staff turns into a snake. Well, the magicians and astrologers and wise men of Egypt, they come and they match power to against power and they throw their rods down and they turn into snakes too. But you'll notice the difference here. Aaron's snake eats all of theirs. God is more powerful than their wise men and power people. Their wizards and those kinds of people. God can take them on. It's interesting if you study Jesus in the gospel. Jesus does the same thing. Study the book of John carefully sometime and know your history a little bit and know a little bit about the, what's going on at the time and you realize that Jesus does the same thing. Everywhere that Jesus goes, he challenges the God in the area. There's a huge temple, the ruins of a huge temple to the god Dionysius standing at Cana in Galilee. Dionysius is the god of wine. He's the one that brings the wonderful grapes. And that valley is the most fertile in the Middle East. And wonderful wine comes out of there. There's another temple to Dionysius over by Rome. And the ruins are still there for that temple. I've seen the one in Israel, in Israel but I've never seen the one in Rome yet. In the temple in Rome, the high temple, it was rumored at times that on the high holy day when they would celebrate and worship Dionysus, occasionally water would be turned to wine. It was in their mythology. Can you imagine what happened when Jesus comes to Canaan? And you remember what he did there? It was his very first miracle. What does he do? He goes into a wedding feast and he turns water into wine. And you have to wonder, all those people must have been standing around saying, who is this? <laughs> but here's the clincher. His wine was better than the wine of Dionysius. Remember what the host said? Why did you say the best wine to last? This is better. It reminds you of the snake. Aaron's snake eats their snake. Jesus moved quickly down to the Pool of Siloam in Jerusalem. In the Pool of Siloam, if you were to go there today, you can go and in the in the grotto there where they laid all the people laid around, all the sick people, you find inscribed in the stones the symbol of the god Asclepius. Asclepius, or sometimes he's known as Seraphis, was the god of healing. And so what is this? Is, this is where they worship the God of healing. So what does Jesus do? He comes in and he picks out a man that has been there for 30 years. And Asclepius can't help him. He's been laying there lame and impotent 
for 30 years and the God of the grotto can't help him. And Jesus goes right up to that man and says, do you want to be healed? Then pick up your bed and walk. 